I'm Dr. Monique Morris. I'm the president and founder of the National Black Women's Justice Institute. We work in three primary areas. One, to uh, increase the capacity of organizations that are working to interrupt and dismantle sexual and gender-based violence, um, primarily sexual and, and domestic violence in black communities. Um, we do a fair amount of work with formerly incarcerated women to expand the opportunity landscape for incarcerated women and girls. And we do a large body of work uh, that includes research, training, and technical assistance to interrupt school to confinement pathways for girls. Um, that includes uh, partnering with different organizations across the country, but specifically in the Bay Area, to implement a pilot educational reentry program for girls who have been systems impacted. Yeah, Push Out is it's called Push Out the Criminalization of Black Girls in Schools and it is a book that collects uh, the narratives of girls who have experienced various uh, pathways to confinement and or criminalization um, but specifically those decisions, policies, practices, conditions, etc. that have rendered them vulnerable to um, not completing school um, to participating in underground economies and eventually to contact with the criminal and juvenile legal systems. Um, the book um, is an attempt to expand a narrative. And so we've spent a lot of time talking about the school to prison pipeline for boys. Um, push out is an opportunity to really narrow the focus and center in this discussion what's happening with girls. Black girls are, uh, you know, a group of girls that people see uh, among the population of children who are impacted by criminalization in schools, but they haven't been at the center of discussions about what we need to do to fix this problem. Um, and because they haven't been at the center, their rate of growth among the children who are experiencing exclusionary discipline, the suspensions, the expulsions, the referral to law enforcement, the arrests in schools has grown. Uh, black girls are the only group of girls who are disproportionately represented across the full continuum of discipline that's captured by the U.S. Department of Education data. And when you talk to girls, you see that they are um, unfortunately experiencing um, a push out and a push away from schools for a host of reasons that are, well, frankly, ridiculous. Um, you know, a lot of people think they're being suspended and expelled because they're fighting, they're being disruptive in ways that are a threat to the public safety. But when you look deeper, you see that um, two things are occurring. One is that black girls are disproportionately being removed from school for subjective incidents that are not threats to violence. They're being removed for dress code violations, they're being removed because they're perceived as sassy or disruptive, they're being removed because they are um, talking back or cursing or speaking out of turn. In some cases, they're being removed just because they've asked a question, right? And that asking of a question was seen by the instructor or the person of authority as an affront to that authority. Um, and then even among the girls who are fighters, um, there is uh, this narrative that I try to build out and push out that um, explores why they're fighting and the ways in which their trauma has been ignored by the adults in their lives, the way the school has failed to respond to conditions of trauma, and not trained the educators and others in the school setting to recognize what their actions are as trauma, uh, as opposed to just a girl with a bad attitude who is constantly fighting. There was a principal at one of the community gatherings who stood up and said that she is no longer, like after reading Push Out, she's no longer um, going to suspend her girls for having a bad attitude. And it was a simple way that she said it, just I'm not going to suspend girls anymore for having a bad attitude. Um, that recognized that she was doing that in the first place and that there was an alternative that could be in play, right? And that she wasn't exercising it before, but now she is. And so um, she's done a lot of work um, with her staff, with her team, um, with her faculty to really think through um, how to respond to girls who are um, exhibiting you know, modes of expression that had uh, traditionally, historically been perceived as disruptive or defiant um, or reflective of a bad attitude. 
uh, and to really think through how to build a more robust alternative to the suspensions and expulsions and to really think about ways of responding to the trauma that she hadn't been responding to before. Um, I've had an opportunity to visit her school and she's really doing some great things. It can't necessarily just be a conversation that happens at the top or a conversation that just happens in the classroom. It really has to be part of a collective um, exploration of what our intention is for black girls and how we then move together to create conditions that make schools safe enough to learn. My first introduction to the justice system was a, a person in my community being recruited to serve on a jury. And I didn't quite understand, I was very young, I didn't quite understand what it meant for a black person to be invited to serve on a jury. And she said she was going to be, she's like, I'm going to make the jury because there's a brother on trial. <laughs> That's how she said it. And I remember being very young, wondering, like, what does that have to do with anything? What does this mean? I never understood justice to be about punishment. I did understand justice to be associated with something that is about accountability. Um, I have come to a space where to me, when you are accountable, it means that there is an absence of harm and oppression that provides an opportunity for healing. So to me, justice has evolved to mean freedom because when the, the, when the conditions and a, a lived experience is free, there is an absence of oppression and harm. So my approach to justice is ultimately about a call to action to remove harm from people's lives in all the way that oppression manifests in order for there to be a freedom to live peacefully. I was with Angela Davis at the launch of my push out tour and she said we were fighting for the black freedom movement. We settled for civil rights. And I don't think that will ever leave me because our discussions about equity have for so long been tied to law, policy, the right to equal access to certain activities and institutions and practices um, that our emphasis on equal access in some ways distracts us from this notion of freedom and peace. Uh, it really boils down to our capacity to remove the consciousness of dehumanization from our lived experience. So many of our policies are dehumanizing. So much of our popular culture is dehumanizing. So much of our basic human interaction denies us an opportunity to fully express our lived being and our process of becoming that uh, it's disgusting. <laughs> and so I think, um, you know, when we lead with love, we have equity because leading with love forces us to recognize the humanity in the other person to recognize that there are beings who are harmed and so they commit harm, but that doesn't mean they're disposable. There are beings who are harmed, so they self-harm. So their unwellness doesn't mean they're disposable. That we have to challenge ourselves to a greater standard because our discussions about equity and justice are hollow unless we fully embrace and understand what it means to have this kind of human connection. We gotta to talk to each other, we gotta see each other, we have to believe each other, we have to understand that justice is not a pie to be divvied, but there is enough justice for everyone to share, that we have to stop fighting and understand that historical trauma is real for everyone. And that until we resolve that grief, we're going to just continue in this cycle of you know, producing more harm. Um, 
we are a society that tends to bury the bad stuff, right? I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to be a part of this. That was so long ago. Get over it. All these things that we say in the name of getting things done, in the name of moving forward, in the name of building wealth, <laughs> maintaining power, that we are failing ourselves. And so um, to me, this conversation about equity is really about coming to terms with all those things that we are getting wrong, that we are, that is demonstrated in our relationship with each other, our relationships with the earth, uh, and our relationships to the institutions that we build. And so, you know, that, that to me is what this is ultimately about. I would really love to see a shift in the narrative and to really think about the ways that we can build community using all the talents that we have together to challenge what we think is possible. Yesterday I invited folks to activate a radical imagination. Um, and what that means to me is really um, not just imagining, you know, what could be, but unconditionally centering this positive question, unconditionally engaging in what we call in the academy an appreciative inquiry that forces us to say, not that you know, bad things you know, don't happen, right? They do. But forces us to say, let's center in our work the promise of justice and love. What does it look like in our society now what could it look like for our children? What could it look like for the generations of our children to come? Given what we know about what has happened with this concept with us and with the generations that have passed. Um, there's a West African concept called Sankofa, which is that you have to know your history in order to know where you're going. Um, and I think that what I would love to see emerge from this conversation is uh, Sankofa as praxis. Understanding the struggle of our ancestors, of our elders, uh, to deeply inform how we emerge with an integrated strategy and practice of centering love in our movement. Um, a lot of this work, anti-oppression work, produces sickness. A lot of this anti-oppression work produces anger, and those are all valid things when you look at what people are internalizing. Um, but it doesn't move us into a space of wellness and healing, so, which to me you know, was part of my definition of justice. <laughs> and so um, I really think it is important to emerge from this conference and this space um, having a renewed commitment to uplift and hold each other in community um, to respect our differences, certainly, and respect the different places where we're going to enter this conversation. Um, not everybody is going to be out on the streets. Not everyone's going to sacrifice their body. Not everybody's going to be in meetings with policymakers. Not everybody's going to be writing data reports and generating uh, scholarship to advance this work. But together, we can shift a narrative. Not everyone can draw, not everyone can dance, not everyone can create film, but there are people who have these skills. And so really building out a community to shift the narrative about justice, about education and the promise of education, to hold ourselves accountable in all the beautiful ways that we know can keep us together without punishing and causing greater harm um, are all important to this work and what I hope will ultimately emerge from this gathering.